All right, greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracal here, Adams van Sale, here to shine a light, not specifically on uh, South African matters, but on a topic and some concepts that I think are very applicable to not just South Africa, but also uh, my guest tonight's uh, own personal uh, experiences all the way there in the United States. Uh, my guest here tonight is the Prudentialist. He's not someone that I think my audience will, will be seeing here for the first time. I think most of you will be recognizing him uh, or his username, I should rather say, from previous episodes. But uh, this is the first time that you're seeing him on camera, um, and he's going to be joining us here tonight. Dapper, as always, to be talking about some topics that he's been doing some reading and thinking about uh, for quite some time, uh, and specifically now recently. Um, and there is a link to, I'm going to start off with some shilling. There's a link to his sub stack in the description, so you can go read for yourself all his, uh, all his writing on it. So welcome back on the show, Prude. Oh, thanks for having me on, man. Greatly appreciate it. All right. So why I wanted to uh, wanted to have you on is that you've been touching on some topics that I think in your writing specifically recently uh, that I don't think are just applicable to your personal context. But I think some of the topics are things that my audience in South Africa and people in South Africa have been thinking about concepts like home, the idea of community, the idea of place. Where do you belong? Where do you feel home? Where do you feel like you're rooted? When you speak about being uprooted or being deracinated, what do you mean? What have you lost? All of these questions flow from these topics of the metaphysics of home and this idea of community. And uh, what I've noticed before we get into the topic is uh, many of your thoughts, there's definitely a correlation between you forming your thoughts and you taking a drive. <laughs> there's definitely a correlation between your vehicle and uh, that act of driving and then getting the thoughts coming to you. It's like that meme of the, so you've got the 21-year-old doomer and then the 28-year-old go-getter and then you have the 26-year-old drive thinker. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, America is such a, a car oriented country that like, especially because like I, I do live in sort of the middle of nowhere in a very rural part of the state. Like, so, you know, I, I live in a place where kids can go to the park or go to their high school where um, it's uh, they'll be on a horse. So, you know, you like driving is sort of just a requirement to really get anywhere. And it requires you to like really contemplate like, well, if I want to go get fast food or something or, you know, something that's just I don't want to cook you know, you have to take into consideration, it's like 30 minutes to drive there. And so it gives you a lot of time to think about it. And until recently, I didn't have a car that had like an aux cord or anything to just listen to music or podcasts or whatever. So you're left alone with your thoughts, because if not, my old car had like a, a rush CD stuck into the CD player. And it's like, as much as I love the album moving pictures, you want to think for yourself. Um, so yeah, I mean, anytime that I go on the road, I usually will drive through something or I'll see something that makes me think and uh, that was also a big part of my like my my last job was just like every Monday I'd have to drive across, you know, the countryside mm -hmm. and, and see what the world is like. And that's a, inspired a lot of my writing as of late is just being on the road and seeing, you know, parts of the country that, you know, America gets sort of split into thirds where it's the East Coast and the West Coast because you have New York and Los Angeles, those big cultural epicenters. And then you sort of have what's known as flyover country and uh, you know, just places that people kind of look down on. Like there's that tweet by Kyle Kalinske that was, um, he was looking down, I think he was like flying over Nebraska or something, you know, in the middle of the country where, you know, yeah. farmland is. And he's like, I don't understand why the land is dug the way that it is because, you know, people <laughs> farm. And it just kind of shows you how, you know, you, you share a land with these people and they have no idea. Yeah. So yeah, driving. But is there's a, there are whole personal. extraterrestrial communities down there that he would uh, not be able to understand or even comprehend. Oh, yeah. It'd be completely <laughs> alien to him. Just like the idea of me living in like Astoria, Queens, New York City would be foreign and mm. alien to me. <laughs> but it is true what you say there when you drive through communities. There are things that uh, catch your eye and you don't have to be a particularly like uh, a, a, a easily distracted person to notice many of these things. I mean, uh, you see, for example, that in South Africa, I always notice the beautiful churches when you drive through small rural towns, specifically in the Karua uh, region of South Africa, all these beautiful sandstone churches. Uh, and I've seen in your writing as well, you write about the small aspects of the towns that you drive through, things that make you think, but why is that there? Or what, what's the story of this building? Or what, um, what is the story of this town or this place? And you actually touch on that specifically in your piece. Um, I think it was called Down the Capillaries, uh, where you were writing specifically on your thoughts that you had just driving uh, through uh, 
places in in America that people like Carl Kolinsky have definitely not uh, have definitely not driven through or even visited. Um, maybe just give a little bit of a uh, not an elevator pitch, but just the the basic idea or, or an introduction to that piece, and then we can go from there. What you wanted to uh, uh, get across there. Well, just it was a lot of observations about this route that I would be on every week, just sort of talking about I have to drive through these six rural, you know, Texas plate counties and just, you know, pick up forms and whatnot. But there's a lot of these vast open, you know, farmers roads and highways where there really is nothing to see except farmland, fencing, barns and mm -hmm. sort of these small towns where there's really just one road. And once you drive through it, you know, that that's the end of the town. But even in those tiny little communities, it's just there's so much life and history that if you didn't drive through it or stop to ask and look around, you wouldn't even know it existed. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think in South Africa, I get the same type of uh, same type of uh, pleasure looking at just uh, when you're driving through these small towns, the little monuments, the 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 little pieces of aesthetics that give those towns their characters. And some towns are better looked after than others. Um, and often... And I've actually recently written about this. And often what's happening now in the time in the age of remote work, uh, a lot of people are leaving the cities and they're going to live in these small towns that because they're chasing that postcard view, but they are going to live in communities that they don't understand. They're going to live in places that they don't they don't really understand why it's beautiful. They don't understand why they're moving there. They're just moving there because it's nice and beautiful and peaceful, but they don't understand the foundation on what that is built. And the foundation, what that, uh, what that town, that aesthetic little town that you're moving to, is built, is the is the fact that their people have been living there for generations. People that have been working, toiling, loving, living in that town, building it and improving it and maintaining it and making sure that the the character of the town is uh, is preserved and they 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 loved where they lived. And that's that's something that. I think, unfortunately, what's going to happen with this big exodus now, people talking about returning to the countryside, unfortunately, I think a lot of people are going to be moving into communities that they don't really understand, like I said, what that why that community is so nice, why that community is so beautiful. Well, yeah, I mean, here in the States, we've been seeing a lot of that where people will flee New York or, or California and they'll be like, well, I can work from home. I can still make decent money and I can, you know, have that sort of the grass is greener on the other side type view. And they don't recognize why it's so nice to begin with. There is a strong intergenerational presence that I don't think a lot of people recognize when they move to rural or smaller parts of the country is that. You know, these places are taken care of because families stayed here and made something of it. And, you know, that's developed for a long time. And now you're sort of this uprooted stranger that's been sort of just, mm. you know, they, they, it happens a lot, especially for like American holidays, like during the Thanksgiving season. You know, they'll get ready to make that big journey out of California or New York. And the news will always like the mainstream media will always do like a little um, like a little snapshot of like the highway system, how it's just backed bumper to bumper for people trying to drive back home. And, you know, and of course those people, you know, it always comes with the usual, like, well, you know, how to talk to disagreeable political differences over the Thanksgiving dinner table or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they just, because they're so there's that distance and there's a different culture, you're trying to come back home to something that you have no fundamental, you know, understanding of. And for me, it's been really sort of that, um learning to appreciate it because it is still foreign to me you know like i i grew up all over the country and all over western europe because my dad was in the military so it was just like i i, I call myself that sort of derogatory rootless cosmopolitan because i am for all intents and purposes there are places that i've stayed for some stretches of time and for several years but nothing that is considered home to me um, and so going back to where family calls home and trying to get, you know, better integrated into the community, understanding your family, you know, being a part of a church community, all of that, you know, allows you to recognize and really appreciate from the outside looking in how precious it is, but also how fragile it can be if you start trying to disrupt it. Mm. And uh, yeah, what you mentioned, the uh, starting to understand what home is and what it means. I mean, that's a that's not a con it's a concept that. I think people inherently understand, but they've often struggled to put into words if they were to be asked the question. It's something you just know. It's one of those things where it just is. Um, and I think, well, neither me nor you are, are wise old men. We have still a lot of years ahead of us to, to figure out what many of these questions mean. But 
in your recent experience thinking about this topic of home and community and place, what are some of the conclusions that you've come to when it comes to that age old question of where is home? What is home? Is home where the heart is? Is it as simple as that? Uh, what are some of the, the contemplations and musings that you've had on that on that question? I, you know, as much as that phrase likes to get touted around, I think that home requires a little more than just where the heart is. Um, you know, they, they never tell that part in the in like the romantic comedy or whatever in, in, in media where it's, um, you know, Hallmark movies in America are terrible about this, where it'll be like some urban, you know, co corporate office worker and she falls in love with a man during Christmas time. And, <laughs> you know, she moves to the small town and she gives up the, the urban life. And it's like entertainingly sort of like there's some reactionary chic to that. They never ask the question of like, she's a complete stranger to this town. Mm. She's not going to be used to the decline in living standards. Not everything is going to be instantly available to her. She may have to drive a considerable length of time to like go mm. to a hospital. Um, and so they never cover that part. All right. And, um, the, the things that I've noticed in, in this sort of conversation and in these, in my own thoughts is that it does require you to like actually know people. Um, you know, it, there, this is exists because there's trust. And for many people that are living sort of these online lives or very rural or very urban city lifestyles, it's just, you don't expect to like ask the guy to like, Hey, can you like watch over my cat or my apartment over next door? Cause they may not speak mm. the same language as you, you know? Um, and whereas people in much more smaller rural communities, they do, and they work together to build that trust and they can rely on, you know, their church group or their book club or whatever to, to take care of them if they need that sort of assistance. But uh, trying to define what home is to me, I mean, home, of course, you, you should have some sort of longing connection to it. I have sentimental value to where I live because despite not really having a connection to it, you know, when we would visit from, you know, deployments and things like that, or wherever we lived, you know, my grandparents are here and things like that. There's family. And being the oldest of my uh, mother's children, it's just like, yeah, I, I remember it. I have a strong sentimental and emotional investment in this area geographically. I don't want to see it, um, you know, get any worse or, you know, see the problems of the of the Metroplex here in, in Texas get closer to it. And all of these things, you know, home, of course, you should have a sentimental rooted connection to it. You should also have the understanding and appreciate that it takes community. It does take the fact that it, it requires labor outside of just your normal job. People here will talk after church and they will try and explain, well, this is what's going on. This is what the city government is going to do. And all those things are, are a part of home. Uh, home isn't just where the heart is. Home is where you put work into it. Mm. Yeah, and to to add to that, I think also for me, uh, I completely concur for with your uh, your thoughts there. But I also want to add, home for me is also just where all your almost where all these little connections that you've built over your lifetime almost come together. This is where all your not only your connections to family and friends, and uh, also your connections to that place, your connections to sentimental places, for example. Um, let's say you're married, the place uh, where you, uh, a place that's special where you and your wife like to go to, or a place where you like to ch take your children to, or the home where you grow, grew up in. It, does, it will make basically uh, any sentimental or sacred places, the church that you go to, or where all the uh, different uh, community organizations that you form part of are. are. So it's, it's this hub and this nexus where all your connections to other people in the community almost come together. It's the place where they're all tied. Um, it might change. You, uh, home is never always the same place. You can always um, move to a different city or a different town out of necessity, um, looking for work or maybe uh, um, uh, for relationship reasons. But at the same time, that place, it then almost becomes your responsibility to turn that place into home. You can't just be a wanderer. You can't just be a nomad that moves from place to place. I mean, that's the, the romantic archetype that you find in a lot of Hollywood movies. But those people never look happy to me they never they never live a life that nomad wanderer life never looks like a type of life that i would like to live even if um i get all the the stuff that that uh, idealized version of that uh, of that archetype gets so i think home in the end to put it even more simply home is where you're rooted uh, in some capacity it doesn't have to be a permanent route but it, it's where all the things that root you to your community and your family and place and 
uh, to the great chain of being. And if you really want to go to the bigger picture, it's where all those little roots touch soil and where they start uh, taking root, it's there approximately where home is. And I think there's still a long way to go for me to figure out all the, the things that uh, are connected to the idea of home, but that's where my thoughts are leading me currently. Well, yeah. And I mean, you and I talk all the time, not on stream. And I, one of the things that always has struck with me is because, you know, the rural urban divide used to have a lot more of a greater level of importance for perspective, because it was, of course, before the internet, you know, the, the, clearly the miles and the kilometer distances between say where you live in the city that did have a big impact on everything about your awareness of what was going on what the news was what your day-to-day -day looked like and nowadays the internet has completely just evaporated that the someone who lives out in the middle of nowhere where he can ride a horse to his local park you know he can have access to the same media and popular culture that someone does in downtown los angeles and the one thing that's stuck with me, and in fact, I referenced it in my speech earlier this year in February at this event we had here in the States, was the you told me about some kid that you were you were walking downtown somewhere and that you heard him speak in perfect Americanized English. And I just mm. thought that he was completely just he was lost. He wasn't home. Mm. You know, uh, uh, if someone like is talking the way that I talk in some other part of the world, it, it does illustrate probably some necessity because of the lingua franca. But I mean, it does say a lot. That person that, is not rooted. Yeah, he's not. He's not rooted in who he is. He's not rooted in his culture. He's not rooted in his language. It is easier to consume mm. or emulate the style of others. That is typically, I think, is pretty much for the worst as we've seen across the world. <laughs> and um, you know, it, it it makes one lose track of what is important mm. and something that I've kind yeah. of taken upon myself when I do go on these drives is like throughout the state of Texas, they'll have little historical markers. So, you know, you'll be driving down even just a rural road and there'll be like historical marker one mile to your left. And um, oftentimes I'll just pull over and read it and just didn't know that some caravan was here in the 1840s or that, you know, there was a great, uh, you know, civil war issue that had taken place around here. It's like things that you wouldn't have appreciated or even known about had these markers mm -hmm. not existed. And, um, the internet makes it very easy for us on our phones to just completely forget that the land that you're living on, there's generations upon generations of people that died, worked, labored, loved, had children, mm. all of that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, their legacies and their stories are literally plowed into or they are, are interwoven into that environment. So, for example, uh, a good example of how those people whether are living or dead, how they are interwoven into that place is that, for example, the planting of a tree. If a person that's long dead planted a tree 200 years ago and that tree still stands there, his impact on that environment is already represented in that simple thing of just planting a tree or building a house or uh, making a beautiful garden. Um, that, for example, maybe is still maintained to that day or starting a community organization that still exists in that town. Uh, the founder of that organization left his mark on that community and influenced that place. And someone in chat said something very profound. A sideliner opinion says, my grandfather's farm in the Karua is such a sacred place for me. Yeah, uh, I think that that leads me to another thought that I've had about home. And that is there are aspects of home in many places. So, for example, like this listener, um, his grandfather's farm. Uh, is a, a place that has aspects of home for him for me as well the house that i grew up in uh back in marmesbury in the small town in the western cape it, it will always be my home even though i don't live there anymore but the the now that i live in pretoria the place where i live now and where uh, i have built social connections and that where i have uh, uh, institutions and community organizations that I go to. This is my new home now. It also has a lot of those aspects of home. But I think uh, that doesn't mean that when you move to a new place that you make your home, it, it just shuts off that previous place that you called home. I think there's always aspects when you go back there that will still uh, speak to you and will still get to, you, you'll still get that same feeling. So I don't think home is a place that's just uh, relegated to one specific place. And then when, when you move away from there, it just shuts down and it's not... Uh, it doesn't have those qualities anymore. And before we continue, I just wanted to say here for uh, Mr. Odin Moja, uh, South African exile there in Florida. Uh, nice to see you here. I mean, if you want to talk to someone that knows 
the concept of what home means and uh, someone that uh, has thought about this idea, seeing as he's there in the United States, a South African, the Mocha Prince of Pretoria, uh, ch chilling there nicely in, in, in the Florida state, the free state of Florida. Um, that's uh, I'm glad to see you're here, Odin, because I know you're someone that understands this uh, this topic very well. Um, but yeah, uh, that aside, um, is there anything you'd like to add there, uh, um, Prudentialist, before you continue? Well, yeah, I home isn't just one singular place. I mean, any place that mm. you had formative years growing up, you're always going to have a, a longing or some sense of affection for. I mean, there's a little town outside of Heidelberg, Germany, that just for me, I would love to go back and visit and just know that I grew up there. And, um, you know, I, I had memories. I remember the roads and the canals and the Hauptbahnhof that was right not, not too far. And it's just, you don't forget it, you know. I mean, any place that you grew up or that you had a formative connection to or had experienced something firsthand uh, will always have some sort of special place to you, especially if you lived there for any length of time, whether it was just a few years or a, a length of time. And I, home isn't just, you know, I mean, there's always that parental ancestral connection. And they, um, it, it's always something that I don't think ever shakes them. Um, and I think that that's something that a lot of our sort of modern day world kind of living tries its best to do so, where you will grow up in a place and you will be, you know, given the best kind of upbringing that you can, the best kind of comfort, mm -hmm. the best kind of parenting. And, you know, in, in what is, I think, kind of um, this illusion nowadays that I think a lot of people have woken up to is, is that they'll tell their kids to leave home and, you know, go get your education, go become something. And then they come back with a completely different worldview, which causes antagonism, which causes resentment. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's reasons to leave home by all means. I mean, there are people should get to training and be or likely to become a good provider or a good family man. But um, it, it becomes so easy to fall into a, a system or a set of beliefs or some sort of cosmopolitan style of life that mm -hmm. uh, puts you to be directly um, antagonistic and resenting your own upbringing, your own home. Right. Yeah, and I think they, what you touch on there is a big difference. There's a big difference between moving out of necessity or moving for a, a very special opportunity and being driven away. And I think what you're uh, uh, what you're talking about there is a misconception where a lot of parents almost drive their children away and say, you have to go to the big city. That's where all the opportunities are. That's where you're going to meet influential people. That's where you're going to network because your network's going to define you. You're not going to be able to build a network here in this backwards little town. Uh, look at how we and other people here ended up. You need to escape. That's the, that's the type of mentality we get from a lot, unfortunately. And I don't think just in South Africa and the United States and many other countries where unfortunately children are driven away from their their communities and by by well-meaning parents but i think they it shouldn't be something that's encouraged it should but it also shouldn't be something that's condemned i think it you take it on a case-by-case -case basis for example me i don't live in the town that i grew up in for and where i lived for 18 years anymore but i'm living now i moved to pretoria to follow my to to follow my calling to come work for afri forum i wouldn't have moved here for any other job just for a, a simple wagey job um i moved here because of i got a very special opportunity to work in in, uh, in the solutions industry in south africa that um i, I couldn't I couldn't pass up and a lot of people have that i don't think those people uh that, that's fine but i think the people that are just being told well you need to uh, move to the big city because that's where the opportunities are i don't think that's that's a sound way of uh, of treating it and i think the same applies for immigration specifically in south africa where i think if you if that is your personal choice you can immigrate but i don't think people should be driven away and chased away and say well the, you should immigrate because there's no future here in south africa no there's, there's a there is a future for many people in south africa you're just going to have to find your uh, your place in the sun you're just going to have to think outside the box there's a uh, uh, you're just going to have to think creatively you know, and you might find some easy opportunities in, in the world out there but uh, you will be uh, probably uh, don't not feel as at home as you would have uh, where you grew up and this is something that you've actually uh, started, to, I've noticed, started talking about a bit more. I mean, I always thought it was just uh, a question that's asked to South Africans. And why don't you just immigrate? Um, but I see you're, you're getting asked that question as well. 
um, in some uh, of your chats that I've seen uh, recently and some of your writing as well, where you answer that question of, well, I'm, I'm not going to leave because America is my home, just as uh, South Africa is the home of someone like, uh, like Ernst. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that was something that Oren McIntyre and I talked about. I mean, the, the question about being an expatriate and mm. uh, we, we kind of looked to you guys uh, over in South Africa as <laughs> yeah. sort of a, the example and the answer is, is that um, home requires work. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, there's old promise. It's almost like a promissory note. Like it requires that promise to be fulfilled in some degree. And you have to work for it. It's not easy. And I think that it becomes something uh, in, and especially in today's life where if things go wrong or if things go bad, um, well, I could just pick up and go somewhere else. There's always a new city, a new opportunity. Um, and you know, the, the thing is, is that some, uh, there's other advice that's been given where it says to, you should live like an expatriate, uh, in your own country. Um, and to some extent that might make sense in the cities, where you could easily get up and go somewhere else. But I mean, for South Africa or the United States or really anywhere, there is no other place that's like it. There is no other place where I live, um, you know, then where do I go? And, and that's that's something that really does come to mind on that issue is, is that, and that's also why I focus a lot more on the, the local politics than I can on, say, the national stuff that happens every two to four years in America, because the greatest level of influence that I can wield is, at the city or county or municipal level above all. Hmm. Well, that's also a shift that I've had in my thinking as well. I mean, just a few years ago, I was a lot more concerned and uh, focused on what's going on in the world, what's going on in America, what's going to happen in the next American election. Now I've, I've, uh, I've pretty much uh, limited my, my focus on the, the bigger world. I've, I've, st I've, started thinking less like a globalist and more like a localist um i'm thinking a lot more along the lines of what's happening in my country and even smaller what's happening in my current community and in my current neighborhood and in my current city thinking smaller and smaller and it's just so much better for your mental health i mean you shouldn't be lying awake about issues that are on the other side of the world i mean it, it, it you shouldn't ignore them you shouldn't stop thinking about them and just uh, completely blank them out of your mind but you shouldn't be obsessed with them you should if you're a south african you shouldn't be obsessed with the american election i um, um, it, it's not healthy um you can you can uh, follow it intensely and you can um, uh, have a strong opinion on it but you shouldn't make it I, I see too many south africans if they for example with the um i think the best example of this I think I would maybe I should first say I think it's a mental illness inducing mentality where you just get completely obsessed with things that are happening in communities on the other side of the world that are, aren't affecting you. And the best example of that's the Roe v. Wade uh, decision where people are losing their minds in Europe and in South Africa and in Asia and in India about a, a court decision in america that's not going to affect them in any way it it was the strangest thing to see where was it the was it the eu parliament that condemned america or something it was, it was the bizarrest thing it's like this ritualistic indignation but about it's like me um it's like for example uh, me living in that small town in the western cape and hearing the news about a traffic light not working in the town next door and i just freak out and i start uh throwing plates against the wall I'm like this that town next door is dysfunctional how can that municipality treat their people like that like it, it's not healthy but it's like i said it's that globalized thinking that's i think making people crazy i don't think our minds and our souls are made to have a global focus constantly um it's i don't think it's healthy and since i've stopped looking at the world through that lens and started thinking a lot more locally than globally it's just been so much better for my mental clarity and uh, for my uh, my general state of mental health as well yeah, it's kind of the inverse to that uh, sort of activist phrase of think globally, act locally, because, mm, mm. um, you know, a lot of those sort of like progressive petty issues, of course, they, they can be, um, you know, and the, they are global in some essence. Um, it, but I mean, it's always as an American, I, I'm both simultaneously aware of the fact that 
there is a lot of cultural exports that come out of America, whether it's out of Hollywood or media, our press, our, our press reporting standards, our judiciary, it, all those things do sort of have a, a chilling effect across the globe, depending on how decisions are. But at the same time, there's my, my chauvinistic attitude about it. It's just like, <laughs> don't you have your own problems at home to worry <laughs> about? Like peering into my window or peering across the fence like a nosy neighbor is probably not going to get you anywhere. But, you know, those are the mm. contradictions, I think, you know, living in sort of the uh, imperial heartland kind of gets you to just be like, <laughs> you know, you're looking across the globe and you're just like, well, you know, I get it. But at the same time, um, you have other issues that and so do I. Um, and it's like uh, and I think that was another part about um, you mentioned the living from home or working from home bit about trying mm. to want to move and whatnot. The other thing that I, I, I wrote, I did a video of sort of at the very beginning of when this whole working from home bit started. And I was kind of like very cautious. I remember about it, yeah. It. Yeah. I I was like, well, you're gonna destroy that like separation between your work life and your home life. And now your home is no longer your home. It's the space for it's your office. It's your office. <laughs> and unless it's clearly separated, then you're not going to have a good time uh working because like you're gonna get up, you're gonna make your coffee, and like what is once your bedroom is no longer your bedroom, it's your office. And I think that that has a lot to do. Um, I think that that sort of phenomenon has a lot also with how we view home. Um, it's like, oh, well, you know, you're sacrificing, you know, the way that your house looks because you have an office or you're going to have a meeting there or whatever, and you don't want people to judge you. It's why, you know, it's sort of what we call like the with, with certain midwits or whatever, they'll have their color coded bookshelf behind them um, because they're sacrificing whatever was themselves in order to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, <laughs> You're, you're, um, you know, you're, you're sacrificing parts of yourself in order to entertain the opinions of others, and you're not actually preserving what is your home. Hmm. Well, I see a uh, Dagbreker says in the chat: South African politics is greatly affected by those who take my, who we take money from, and strongly determined by outside elements. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, you can't uh, pretend like you don't live in a globalized world. You can't pretend like the 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 war. I mean. It's an ex it's something that you hear all politicians blaming every problem on, but it is true that the war in Ukraine is affecting uh, other countries all across the world. I mean, it's it would be it would be ludicrous to deny that. What the extent of it is, that's the big debate. But when it comes to uh, uh, what's going on in the world, what I'm talking about is getting obsessed with things that that don't really matter in your country. Getting obsessed with and specifically cultural war aspects that don't really matter in your country. Um, for example, take a, another uh, another interesting issue that I, I see a lot of South Africans, both left and right, uh, completely lose their, their obsession, they lose themselves in their obsession is, for example, the gun debate in the United States. Very important debate, very interesting debate. A lot of uh, uh, concepts that are that need to be debated, not just in the United States, but in other countries. But when it comes to let's take the left wing response in South Africa this time as the the, the 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 case study, so now you've got all these opinion pieces in South Africa talking about guns bad and how uh, South Africa needs stricter gun legislation so they can meet their virtue signaling quotes of look I'm also contributing to the culture war I'm also fighting uh, evil guns. But they they're talking about an issue that has no impact on South Africa, seeing as we have these absolutely insane gun regulations it's it should it's not a debate you're trying to astroturf something that's not relevant in south africa but it's because these journalists in south africa and these commentariat live in a different reality they live in a reality where south africa is just another state of the united states so their debates are our debates if i don't put a, if i don't have an opinion on roe v wade how can i call myself an american says the south african journalist that's a that's that's a type of mentality that we're getting and that's what i'm warning against is what you should be careful of is yes be very aware about what's going on in the world around you that's affecting your country and your community and also have your say you can have an opinion on many things happening in other countries i'm not a supporter of that idea of oh you don't even live here you you don't you don't have a say in this like you do have a say in this especially what uh, uh when it comes to what's happening uh, in the global superpower i mean even in south africa far away from the empire you still have a a vested interest in in regards to who's the next american president it's going to have an effect on you but uh, like i said just to a final thought there it is important not to get obsessed in the small cultural details that you can objectively verify 
don't really affect you, but it's a hot button topic in another country. And it's something that everyone now needs an opinion on. For example, if you're in South Africa, no matter what side of the debate you fall on, you don't need a strong opinion on, uh, on George Floyd in America. That's a very specific American issue. It's you shouldn't be lying awake at night about it and ending friendships over it or uh, disowning family members on their stance towards gun gun legislation in America. Like, that's what I'm talking about. Well, the the thing with sort of like you mentioned, like the empire is, is that um, there is sort of a global information cascade. So if something out of, you know, the, the commentary or political classes interests here in the United States, you know, it gains traction. It's a highly, you know, you'll see it trend on Twitter or something like that. I mean, that cascades to other parts of the world. Well, what is it like here? And by sort of that, you know, aspect of exporting liberalism globally, um, this sort of idea that we can just, you know, institute that anywhere in the world and that, um, you know, we, we are people out of time because we've created a system that allows that, you know, where history can finally sort of like creep to a halt. And like clearly the project of exporting liberalism globally has to some degree failed because, you know, it doesn't work. And in some like, degree it was a major success in, yeah, in some degree to tried to achieve. <laughs> yeah, and to some degree, yeah. But I mean... Uh, that's why, but I mean, it's this constant um, nitpicking over incentives that, yeah, um, oh, well, I have to have an opinion on this because if I have mm. an opinion on it and it's well received, then maybe I can also write elsewhere or I can, um, you know, be featured on a different platform or be featured on a different program. And so they have to, they have to reflect or, or provide a review or a response to what happens here. It does erode, I think, a lot of your attention or your focus on at home. I, I mean, in the same way that I like talking to you and I like following other South African uh, mm. commentators and writers, because I think that the way that things are going in the United States, we're probably going to understand what, you know, people like you and what Afri Forum does for a living in order to maybe, you know, look ahead for the American future in mm. some parts. But um, I mean, yeah, the, the gun debate, I think, though, is, is someone who's very pro gun and carries. It's just that you should have one. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. if there's been any significant amount of work that AFRI Forum has done and what others have done in your country, it's the importance of being armed for self-defense should be vital. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't discount that debate. There are quite a few debates that do happen mm -hmm. in America that have a substantial effect because, you know, where, uh, where parts of America go, you know, uh, there's a famous phrase that where California goes, so goes the country. Um, yeah. You know, with the direction California has gone culturally, infrastructure, their political, like, you know, class and rule, um, that does impact the rest of the country. And by a large extent, mm. it will impact the rest of the world. And so I wouldn't necessarily discount those mm. debates, but like you, like the old saying goes, you know, think globally, but act locally, that you should keep these mm. things in the back of your mind because right. those debates do happen and they will mm. inevitably impact your local politics. And you should come up with a very native, so a very South African mm. response to those questions. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I say people shouldn't get too, uh, too uh, caught up in the American details because our debate, for, for example, our debate surrounding firearms is completely different. Here, it's just like, uh please if i can i can we just have a five-year process where there's a possibility of after five years i can get my firearm if i if i jump through all the hoops and pay all the fees and everything um but yeah now when it comes to uh living in a globalized world i think you should be careful that your mind doesn't become uh globalized and you start thinking in a, in a globalized fashion because then you uh you're not going to see the reality around you clearly and you're going to be uh, there's going to be a presidential election on the other side of the world and then you're going to be uh, your candidate's not going to win and then you're going to be blackpilled in your own country it's like oh it's over boys we lost not going to make it <laughs> but um, even if that presidential election is going to have an effect on your country is not going to it's your candidate winning is not going to affect you in such a way that you uh, should be now sitting in, in a pool of your own tears um Something that I also wanted to talk about, uh, something that you actually recently wrote about, is uh, if I really wanted to uh, hype it up, I would have said you wrote about the great chain of being you were writing. But basically, you were writing about uh, intergenerational relationships, responsibilities, communication, friendships. And by, again, using that style that you've established for yourself, where you're using your own uh, experiences and taking, uh, getting insights, uh, tapping insights from them. 
And you recently wrote a piece specifically on that uh, that topic of maybe we shouldn't just say, oh, uh, uh, screw the boomers. Maybe there are some some older people that actually know quite a bit about life, uh, a lot more than you. And uh, maybe you should listen a little bit and maybe you might just learn something. Um, and that piece is on your sub stack. I can't remember exactly what the title, the title is escaping me now. Uh, what was it? Oh boy, <laughs> asking me to remember something I wrote <laughs> a couple of weeks ago is going to have its own challenge. But um, yeah. uh, uh, let me go find the, the title salon. But you know what piece I'm talking about. I, 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 I do, um, yeah. but I, I, I can pull it up and we can uh, go from there. But the, the premise was just about, again, one another drive. And it was about the um, just the importance of having those relationships with people that you do, you know, that are older than you. I think that there is a lot, um, the, the friends that you make along the way is what yes, it was called. Uh, yeah. So just for the, for clarity, for the listeners that want to go read the full piece, um, it's, uh, was published on 16 July on a Prudentialist Substack. And the title is the friends you make along the way, a little bit on community and our elders. Um, and yeah, and that's, uh, I really thought that was an important topic to touch on because so many in our generation specifically just like to, uh, whether they be right wing or left wing, like to just throw uh, the previous generation under the bus, maybe without knowing it's like, oh, they just messed up everything. And now we have to live with the consequences. And like, yeah, maybe in some regards, but also you have to understand these oaks also were people. They also had their problems. They also had their culture war in some extent, and they made mistakes, but they also made brilliant moves. And you have to uh, sometimes just sit, sit and listen, and you might learn something. And that's what you touched on in that piece. Yeah, and I mean, oftentimes the intergenerational kind of warfare does happen. I mean, there's a mm. there's a million different articles about you know in in the mainstream news outlets about how millennials killed this business mm. or millennials killed this cultural trend, and they'll turn right around to them and it'll be like, oh well, you Gen Xers, you Boomers, you guys really you know messed it up for us. That's why these things are dead. We can't afford it. Um, and they do serve part as like the political dialectic and conversation, but I mean. The thing about understanding people that are older than you or before you is, is that it is the natural aspect of, you know, having a relationship to those that are older than us and mm. that we should have a, a better, you know, uh, relationship to them. And we, we should understand that we, we shouldn't take these things for granted. And I think I, I had said that in that piece is that if I, it sounds like I'm talking about something that at one point in time uh, we take for granted. Uh, that's because nowadays we we don't really have a relationship to those that are older than us or to our our, our grandparents or, or or things like that. Um, and to me, it's just very interesting because you know there's that rise of single parent households. There's family that lives all over the place, or that people will abdicate parental responsibility and hand someone a, access to the internet, a phone, or a tablet, or turn on the television and not really raise them. And um, you know, and it, it does kind of show you, like you mentioned, your great chain of being. There's always the 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 great chain of mentorship and and relationships mm. to other people. And um, something that, like, I, I also wrote in that piece is that I've noticed that you know, like, I'm, thirty is you know, barreling towards us very quickly. <laughs> and um, you know, mm. it's strange when people younger than us are asking people our age for advice because it's just like I can tell you mm. what not to do. I don't know. I don't know what I can tell you what to do. But it, it you can use it, me as a case study. <laughs> yeah, you can use me as a case study, right, of what not to do. But um, you know, it does emphasize, I think, a lot of the important parts of our relations to others. And uh, we do for a lot of, once upon a time, older people would take community for granted. But for us, um, it's a very precious, almost like a rare earth mineral or a gem mm. or something like that. Yeah, there's that uh, that old cycle of um, first when you're when you're very small, when you're like a small child, you think, well, my parents know everything. <laughs> and then you get a little bit older and like, yeah, my parents know quite a lot. And you're a teenager and like, oh, my parents don't really know anything uh, at all. And you're in your 20s and like, yeah, they know my parents know nothing. And then you're a bit older in your late 20s. And you're like, oh, maybe my parents knew. Something. Oh, they knew everything. <laughs> uh, and, th and then when you get older and, uh, and you're that unfortunate position where your parents aren't there anymore, then you realize, shit, my parents knew quite a lot. They Maybe they did know everything. <laughs> yeah That's there's some sort of joke about that where like the young man gets old and he's like wow in five years my dad learned everything or something like that you know and uh -huh. 
Um, but I mean, that, that does talk about a lot of, uh, of our youth and a lot of, and I don't know if it's a recent phenomenon because I just, I don't think that the concept of the rebellious teenager was always as prominent as it has been now in a lot of like popular culture. I mean, sure. You know, kids are going to want to not do what they want to do, especially when they're testing the boundaries when they're getting older. I don't, I, I, I was a rambunctious, annoying teenager. I remember it, mm -hmm. but like, um, you know, it, there was also that reverence towards, you know, parental figures, a reverence towards a priest or something like that. Like, and nowadays that feels so very foreign because things are, are far more diverse. Things are far more deracinated. You're more concerned about what people say online. Um, and yeah, like the, the, the comment says, I miss being 18. I knew everything back then, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's like, you know, the more, you know, about something, the, the more you realize, Oh, I don't know anything at all. Yeah. And, um, it was, the, the best way to demonstrate that sentiment was when, uh, Carl Rittenhouse said something like, Oh, he supports uh, black lives matter and everyone, uh, all these, uh, right wing Twitter and on Twitter accounts was like, Oh no, now we have to disown him. I'm like, yeah, of course. When you were 17 years old, you were completely based in Red Bull and, <laughs> and absolutely clued up on every single cultural issue. And you were just uh, the epitome of uh, of knowing everything. Of course, that's uh, exactly who you were. So you have the right to, to cru crucify this, this boy. Well, I mean, uh, the same thing, right, with our, our historical narratives and myths of our homeland also kind of get... Um, are, are distorted or our lenses are blurred by the current cultural war. Like there was a, um, a recent interview by a, a world war II veteran. Uh, he mm -hmm. just turned 100 years old and, you know, he was crying and he was really sad that like the country, um, you know, he, he does the kids these days don't have the same opportunities he had growing up or when he was older. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of like backlash to the interview when he was like saying all this. He's just like, well, you know, like, look at what happened after like 1945. Look at what happened now. And um, it, it's just really depressing. And it's like he should have just like really recognized the consequences of his actions fighting in that war. And it's like, you know, he was like seven years old when the Great Depression started in 17, mm. when like, you know, Germany invaded Poland. It wasn't like you know, he was completely aware back then the country was different. You did what, you know, was right for your homeland or what you were told was right for the country. And nowadays, um, I think a lot of our cultural battles um, do blur, I think, a lot of what home is or what home was mm -hmm. or what our memory of home is supposed to be. And um, mm -hmm. like Minoan says in the chat, advertising was a plague on our society. I mean, advertising um is also for us like i know a lot of people on twitter or will look towards like 1950s style <laughs> you know boomer advertisements of like the suburban household and the nuclear right. family like return to tradition and it's just like you're looking at what the guys in madison avenue new york city were coming up with to sell you coca-cola or a propane mm -hmm. grill it wasn't what it actually was like and we uh we end up falling in love with fake memories of what a home mm. is not just uh, feeling nostalgia for a time you never knew yeah <laughs> and I, it's, it's, there's someone who came up with a word for it and I, I think it's like ammonia or like ammonia something like mm. that um ammonia but anyways it was like nostalgic or feeling homesick for a place that you have no connection to or that you can't remember and i mean it, it's nice in a lot of ways where um lately and um I sent an essay off. I can't tie, dive too much into it because it still needs to be edited by the guys I sent it off for publication. But um, I, lately I've been feeling very nostalgic for uh, like 1940s and 30s, like swing band, large orchestral. <laughs> yeah. uh, like I, I can put it on and I feel like I'm at home somehow, although I have mm. no living memory to that time period. You know, like but even then, almost my, is as if you have a cultural memory, a cultural memory. Yeah. But nothing that I can distinctly I can be like, oh, yeah, those were the days back when I was like <laughs> 17 and it was 1935. You know, like I can't do oh. that. But and but uh, it is a cultural memory, but it, it makes you longing for a place that doesn't really exist anymore. Never really did exist. Mm. And I think that's also something that's very perilous that we have to be about when we're digging into our past about our homeland or our country or even our small towns. It's just like, hmm. well, how much am I looking into that is my home? That isn't my, uh, that, that is just a fiction or maybe a poorly attempted reconstruction compared to what actually was there. And that's why talking to people is so important. Um, especially talking hmm. to your elders, you know, even if they are in their sixties or even older, I think that 
asking them what life was like back then. I mean, what better source than a primary one? Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a very valuable source of perspective, I think, specifically, where you can just ask, well, what was your experience of this time in history? And I mean, this is a, a valuable uh, source of perspective that you have with any uh, elder that you can talk to, where a lot of people don't use that opportunity. They just think, well, I know better now because uh, history is linear. That means everyone that came before me is inherently more stupid and less informed than me. I'm just standing uh, at the, the, the edge of uh, the cutting edge of everything, of insight, of perspective, of problem solving, of the, the long march of history. And it's, I think, as soon as you start thinking more cyclically about history rather than linearly, it just becomes more naturally that appreciation for older generations. You're like, oh, wait. And I always get these little moments where it just dawns on me again and again, almost like a almost like a little epiphany every time of the same idea, the same concept. I rediscover it constantly when I read, for example, an old book and the writer uh, references something in their version of the culture war. And I'm like, shit, this guy lived 75 years ago and he's thinking the same about the same things as me. I was, uh, I was reading, I think I, I said this in one of your live chats in the chat section. Um, I was reading um, this book, uh, which is uh, Liberale Nationalisme by M.P. van Wijk Lowe. And he wrote this. Let me just make sure I get my facts correct. So this was written in uh, 1958. And he's writing here. And then he catches me off guard by like referencing James Burnham's managerial revolution. I'm like, this guy, <laughs> like an Af Afrikaner that lived uh 75 years ago and he's referencing a writer that people in my circles are talking about now and a, a book that was not, a lot closer to that time and a lot more fresh in the in the culture that time than it is now and it just gave me that little bit of perspective again and a lot of a lot of experiences give me that perspective I'm like wait so you're telling me these people that lived 100, 200, 300 years ago were thinking about a lot of the same problems that I am now, a lot of the same just eternal problems that uh, we are that we are uh, tied to as as humans, as humanity, as Western civilization. Also, it it's the it's the strangest thing. I don't know if you've experienced uh, something similar. Well, yeah, not not too long ago, I was reading some old political essays and. Uh, there was one from like Murray Rothbard in 1992. So, you know, 30 years ago, not that, not that long ago, but he was debating about a lot of the same uh, issues that we are debating today of uh, like, what are we supposed to be, you know, on, on this like political spectrum? Like, what are, are we supposed to be free trade? Are we supposed to be protectionist? Mm -hmm. Are we supposed to be this? Are we supposed to be that? And it's just like, we haven't, it's like the dialectic is almost timeless in some degree that we haven't moved on. We haven't learned, we haven't answered these questions yet. Um, but, uh, recently I bought, uh, some rather old, older textbooks and, um, I bought like a, a very first edition copy of an American textbook called the American pageant. And it was written, um, shortly after the Korean war. So like, uh, mid 1950s. And, you know, it was just, a, a different perspective and, and narrative on what the country was like and who the people that mm -hmm. lived within it. And, uh, it was just it was refreshing to not read something that was just dripping with editorial positions left and right. It had a relatively positive view of the country and where we are today. Uh, and like the, the book ends on a note with a, a bit of optimism about like the, the future only knows what's in store for us. And nowadays I think that a lot of people will ask, well, that no one knows what the future has in store for us. And it's very, um, <laughs> it's with a much different and dreadful tone. So it's you know, nice it's, though to look back that way. It's a it's a it's a term that I've I've often used, but I'm using it less often. Uh, it's uh, we're living in interesting times, and yeah. it dawned on me one day everyone thought they were living in interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> the I mean, uh, the the my ancestors that came here on a wooden ship 
uh, to a continent that they have no idea what's going on. I think they also told each other, "Oh, interesting times." Eh? <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, that, um, I not to not to be too much of a shill, but I did a video not mm. too long ago called "The Two Forests," and there's this there's this meme that goes around about the differences between like American and European forests, where you know Europe has this mythos, this culture of you know you have mm. gnomes and toadstools and castles, and there's a medieval chic to it that's been told in folk tales and in legends and then american forests it's just these unknown horrors beyond human comprehension you know uh, <laughs> all these cryptids all these cryptids and skinwalkers and just the, the things that get caught on trail cams that don't look human or don't look like an animal and they're like well what's the difference between the two and the difference between the two is that europe is ancient it's old it has yeah. history america is still very much the new world where we're yeah. you know people are still talking about grainy footage of a sasquatch or bigfoot and they do so because these things the forest of america is still unknown we have all these caves and parts of forested land that aren't truly explored to the same degree others do and mm. um i think that that's kind of what makes it interesting i'm sure it's the same way with uh, with your ancestors that came on to south africa that mm. uh, sense of unknown that sense of dread that it takes work to make something your home. Home is always right. worth the sacrifice. Home is always worth the effort. It's worth putting the work, blood, sweat, and tears in. Mm. No, that's a that's a, a perfect way to tie the two together. Because uh, in the end, I think what you're describing there is an important point that what Europe has is just a million times what America has in layers. It's just layers and layers and layers and layers of that same myth making that you're talking about there. It's just been had more time. Yeah. It's had a lot more going on. I always, I, I experienced the same thing. So I, what I like, one of my hobbies is studying other people's hobbies. So I like to, for example, uh, I'll for a while look at videos about different hobbies that people have. So I've looked at, and one of the hobbies that I, I like to watch but don't do is metal detecting. I like to look at other people doing metal detecting. And I always think to myself, people living in Europe, when they go metal detecting, they can find anything from like uh, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. There's this entire spectrum of just, life and civilization and everything that's happened that's just stacked on top of each other wherever you walk you can just go metal detect and you'll find like a fucking shred of a viking battle axe in the backyard or whatever because it's just there's layers and layers and layers and layers of history oh there's a, there's and, a really beautiful example of that um mm. so if you ever by chance find yourself in germany go to mm. the city of cologne and next to the giant towering gothic beautiful roman catholic cathedral uh which alleges to have the relics of the, of the three wise men um mm. right next to it is this giant museum of roman artifacts and the roman colony that was there and you know you can go through and step underground and see places that were excavated these tombs or inscriptions that were written to ancient roman gods and, and things like that versus right next to it of course the giant you know reaching cathedral um and it's right. just that tells you how much history there is there you know this mm -hmm. medieval cathedral that survived world war ii is right next to um the remains of a roman settlement and uh mm. it's just it's mind-blowing about that sort of aspect and for yeah. like us our home it still has its mythos and history to still mm. be etched and recorded yeah and uh, uh what i was thought what i thought about uh when i look at for example these european metal detectors i just think well i can't really if i were to do it in south africa i can the most interesting thing i could probably find is something from the anglo boer war and that's a hundred years that's just over a hundred years ago um and it's i'd have to go to a specific battlefield to do it i can't just go in my backyard and find it and in in places like europe you go in your backyard you find a coin from 1420 or whatever um and that was just uh, one of one of the thoughts that i had when i was looking at that hobby specifically i was just contrasting in my mind as well and thinking about the oldest building in south africa is the castle uh, the castle of good hope in cape town and it's 400 years old that that's it our oldest building is 400 years old they are they are taverns in 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 the united kingdom that are older than than that um so it's it's that valuable perspective that you need to have between some places just have these layers and layers and layers while other places are still the layers are still being made as you said america even though a lot of people don't view it that way is still the new world 
Um, and uh, Cringe Walker here says, uh, some perspective, when Joe Biden was born, the last Civil War veterans were still around. And when those men were born, the last Revolutionary War vets were still around. Uh, this is more your ballpark of your corner of the world's history, Prude. So what are your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it does tell you how incredibly young the, the country is. And for perspective, although by managing to have children later in life, the 10th president of the United States, uh, President Tyler, has living grandchildren, or at least he has one grandchild who can distinctly directly trace his lineage back to the 10th president of the United States. I mean, America is still a very young place. We're just a very big place. Uh, my favorite phrase growing up when I lived overseas was that, you know, in America, 100 years feels like a long time ago. But in Europe, a hundred miles seems like forever, and um, <laughs> you know it's that's that's right. a big part about it. Is is that you know uh, America's a, a, at least a, a goodness um, expansive history of people going out and digging and settling in some places, and others venturing forth and onward. Um, but it doesn't have a lot of history, and so a lot of people um, <laughs> go out of their way to um you know have a lot of pride in things that were made only maybe like 112 mm. 110 150 years ago and um there's a lot of places like that that are very dedicated to it i mean if you visit some counties or small cities or small towns here in texas they'll they'll give you literature about the history of this place and even though it says founded 1856 or 1889 or whatever mm. um there it's very detailed and rich and even and it does mm. tell you just how massive the breadth of history is because even these tiny little places that have only been on the map for maybe 150 years or less have already you know history books about themselves as thick as bibles then mm. um you know imagine how much you know history your home has and that how much about it do you know do you know about the mayor do you know about these scandals do you know about events that took place you know even 70 years ago it should it illustrates to us how the modern world has completely uprooted us from the, our, our, the history of our own backyards. Yeah, and there's a lot of fascinating stuff to find there. Um, I think if you live in a town, even if you live in a, a town or a, a city, if there's a local museum that's specifically dedicated to your town or part of the city's history or your city's history, I, I think you would, should definitely go there. Rather than going to your national history, uh, national museum i think prioritize going to your local museum see what's going on there and see what has been preserved there i think you might be surprised at what you find um i see it just on a light to know dachbreaker says i don't swim in the cape town ocean i once saw the carcass of a sea lion on, a sea lion on my way with my shorts and flip-flops i turned around went i'm not swimming with those sharks <laughs> and then i see uh, um there was another comment that i wanted to uh, highlight and that is a uh, Seamus who says the oldest building in my village is 1200 years old and the oldest structure is Neolithic um, and I see a Arden party says my hometown is one of the oldest settlements in the new world and it's still less than 400 years old exactly and I see here um, sideliner opinion says you find bridges in Europe uh, much older than South Africa and America as countries yeah absolutely that's that's the perspective that you need um that's uh that's the type of stuff that uh, you need to keep in mind that's what we've been touching on but yeah uh mr prudentialist uh we've reached the end or we're winding down now towards the end of uh tonight's excellent conversation i really enjoyed it but uh before we say goodbye i i've i've started asking all my guests on this channel the same question because i think it's the it's the way i want to end episodes and that's i want to give you the opportunity now to if you were to give the audience something to think about an idea it can be a rhetorical question anything that you want them to keep at the back of their mind to chew on this week in this week ahead um what would you give them as a final thought um for all of you to chew on then that are watching in the audience uh i would ask you all then to uh and consider and ask when's the last time that you spoke to your parents even if you don't live with them or you're miles away or you don't get along with them um when's the last time you spoke to them because odds are you're probably gonna learn something from them or you need to figure out stuff that's happening on on the home front with family wherever you may live um this whole conversation we've been talking about the what is home to us and of course home is more than just what we sacrifice or what we work for it's also our lineage and you know you're part of the posterity that they made for the next generation for what will be home and so you know call them talk to them because you never know what you're going to learn 
and you're never going to realize how much you may have missed out on growing up. So that's what I would say. Go talk to your family. Go talk to your parents. Mm. No, that's a, that's a perfect way to end. And uh, yeah, before we say goodbye, I also need to uh, just thank the the sponsor of tonight's episode again they're a sponsor that's been a sponsor of my channel for a long while and i really appreciate it and uh but they're specifically a service for south africans and that is a uh, bidvice uh, which is the complete hedge against the global debasement of money inflation and government overreach uh which and they're also a south african first bitcoin only self-custody solution that helps individuals and entities buy and hold bitcoin for their long term Bitvice believes that everyone should hold their own Bitcoin and trust no one else. And recently, there's been a, a plethora of crypto custodians going bankrupt, taking their clients' Bitcoin with them. This is why Bitvice never holds your Bitcoin. They send it immediately to your own Bitcoin wallet where you hold the keys. So simply sign up to Bitvice, link your bank account securely, and buy Bitcoin in seconds for yourself where it will be safe. Uh, so visit uh, bitvice.io. There's a link in the description um, and begin your journey in buying and securing uh, uh, your own uh, crypto. And uh, yeah, if you only have any uh, questions for them, you can also send an email to them um they are very quick to respond you can also check out their their podcast called by the horns and yeah thank you very much for for sponsoring yet another episode of advice i really appreciate it prude thank you very much for your time uh, i really really found this conversation interesting i think it's we touched on things that i think about uh, uh, on a regular basis specifically recently and i can see through your writing that you also think about it quite a lot um and i think Whereas some people might be chasing the views by going for those hot takes, going for those edgy topics. I think what we discussed tonight, the ideas of home, the ideas of place, the ideas of community, the ideas of intergenerational relation. Um, I think these are the things that are important. I think these are things that people need to be thinking about. And uh, I'm certainly going to be thinking a lot more about them and continue to be grappling about with how I understand them and what uh, my answers to many of my own questions to you here tonight will be. So um, uh, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it and also enjoyed uh, chatting to you. And I also just lastly want to say thank you to everyone that tuned in. You've again, once again, been an amazing uh, live chat uh again very distracting with all your jokes good insightful comments and also your excellent questions um and i really appreciate all the the love and support that you give here um and all your comments and all your questions form part of the content here so it, it better be good quality and that's why i'm glad that you are uh bringing your side in that regard as well so thank you very much and then prude um i'll chat to you again real soon and i hope everyone has an excellent uh, evening a uh, great week ahead and remember what prude uh, asked you at the end of the the episode there think about it a little bit and uh i'll see you on